Thank you for joining me in session nine of the Lifeway study of the Minor Prophets. We're studying Hosea, and this is Hosea chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. The lesson title is The Sin Harvested, and the lesson summary statement is God's judgment will be experienced by those who reject Him. <clears throat> I've written on the board as the class comes in this statement from Thomas Jefferson, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. That is setting the tone for the lesson that's coming up. And to begin the lesson, I'm going to ask the class, suppose that you knew, all you knew about the lesson was the lesson title, The Sin Harvested. What would be some of the truths that you would anticipate the lesson is going to cover? And so I'll solicit responses from them. Things like uh, the title speaks of consequences because it's talking about a harvest. It's uh, talking about sin and sowing sin. I, I might even ask them the question, you notice the title, it says, The Sin Harvested. So what would be the idea of the sin that would be the greatest of seriousness when it comes to harvesting of sin? And of course, the lesson points out it's rejecting God. Now chapters 9 through 10 is a section in which it's, experienced, it's explaining about God's people and how they have rejected God. And chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, the main reason why they're experiencing the judgment of God is because of their depravity. And that chapter begins with them uh, being desiring the wages of a prostitute. And then in chapter 9, verses 10 through 17, another reason is given for them being judged by God, and that is this persistent rebellion upon their heart. And then we come to chapter 10, which would be our text, and chapters 10, verses 1 to 11, talks about a divided heart. And we'll see that their hearts are drawn towards their military and towards their false religion, instead of the true God. And then the fourth area of the reason for their uh, judgment is uh, their refusal to repent, chapter 10, verses 12 to 15. So the lesson summary statement, God's judgment will be experienced by those who reject Him. And the question to ask is why? And the first reason that's given for us in this lesson is because of false religion. Chapter 10, verse uh, 5 through Eight. Now, the fundamental uh, basis of false religion is self-reliance rather than trust on the one true God. They trusted in their false religion. They trusted in their kings. And so as we read through the text, uh, I want us to interact with the text and questions that the class might have. Verse 5, the residents of Samaria will have anxiety over the king calf of Beth Haven. There are two, path, two ways this section can be divided up in terms of verses 5 through 8. Verses 5 through 6, it's talking about they're unable to protect their graven images, and this causes them real grief. And then in verse 7 through 8, uh, it talks about the futility of human self-reliance. And so they're unable to protect their graven images, and that creates anxiety, creates fear, and, and uh, over the calf of Beth Avon. Now the calf was at Bethel, which is the house of God, and it was a very significant place in the history of Israel, and your leader's guide points that out. One of the reasons is because this is where Abraham met with God, and so they're going to the place where Abraham met with God, but what they're actually experiencing is their, he calls it the place of wickedness. Indeed, he says, it's idolatrous priests rejoiced over it. The word priest here is not the typical word that is used to describe God's priest. It is a word that is consistently used in the Old Testament to describe the priests of Baal. It's exclusively used of those men. And it says those, indeed, it's idolatrous priests rejoiced over it. The people will mourn over it, over its glory. And it's talking about this idol. And notice that he says, he calls them the people. He doesn't call them Israel. 
He doesn't call them Samaria or Ephraim. He certainly doesn't call them God's people. He says the people. There, there, there is a, a distance that's beginning to creep in. And they will mourn over it, over its glory. Now, it could be their, the glory is talking about the idol itself. It could be the fact that the idol was probably coated in gold. It will certainly go into exile. The very God they worshiped is going to be carried away from them. <clears throat> Verse 6, the calf itself will be taken to Assyria as an offering to the great king. This phrase, great king, is a phrase that was used by the Assyrians of their king. And so we're talking about the Assyrian king as it's mentioned here. And this offering is not a gift, though it had spiritual implications. Ephraim will experience shame. Israel will be ashamed of its counsel. Shame is a result of a loss of honor. And uh, their symbol of worship, this idol, is being carted off. <clears throat> they made absolutely the wrong decision. And instead of them repenting, they stayed with this idol. And as a result, they're going to regret. They're going to have regret and it's going to bring sorrow into them. Now, in verses 7 through 8, there are these pictures of human, uh, the futility of human self-sufficiency. Notice, he says, Samaria's king will disappear like foam on the surface of the water. When a wave comes in, it will oftentimes leave foam, and then before long, the waves take it out, and it has disappeared. And he's talking about the uh, Samaria's king. He's light. He's uh, worthless. He's unstable. He's going to fall to the invading Assyrians. There's no strength and weight to him. <clears throat> the high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, will be destroyed. Thorns and thistles will grow over their altars. Here's their place of worship. And what he says is it's going to experience the same fate. It's going to be deserted. It's going to be overgrown, it's going to become a wasteland. So they put their faith in their king and he's going to be gone. He's, he's of no significance. They put their faith in their altars, their pagan worship, and it's going to be overgrown. It's going to become a wasteland. Now notice how they respond. It says, they will say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. They're either saying, we want you to hide us from the judgment that's coming, or they're saying, we want to die. But instead of repenting, their prayer is to be hidden or to die. These are people who are so deeply involved in their own self-sufficiency. So, this false religion is characterized by self-reliance. If that's true, then true religion is characterized by dependence upon God. We're depending on God, on the God who raises the dead. So true religion makes me face my limitations and, uh, and cast myself on Him. So how does this self-reliance versus trusting in God find its expression in the different experiences of life? Now the text is talking about this judgment coming through this invading army that's going to decimate their worship and decimate their king. And that's not our uh, situation. But we have situations in which we also face, am I going to trust myself or am I going to trust God? Am I going to be dependent upon God? So what I've done with these kind of situations is I've picked some that I think maybe would connect with people in a class. At least maybe one of them would connect with people. And I want, I want the class to discuss how is it that you respond if you are self-reliant? And how would you respond if you're dependent upon God? For example, the first situation. There's someone that I love and I can't fix them. Now, what does the person who's confident in themselves, self-reliant on themselves, how would they respond to that? And on the other hand, how would someone respond if they're dependent upon God? 
By the way, we are not performing this at an airport with a helicopter landing, in case you can hear that. We happen to have some construction work going on outside. Forgive me if that uh, interferes with the sound. Someone I love that I can't fix. What, what is the response of someone who's depending upon themselves to fix that person as opposed to someone who's trusting in God to deal with that person? Second situation, how about old lingering wounds that I can't heal? How does someone respond who's self-reliant? How does someone respond who's depending upon God in that matter? A third occasion, an aging process that I can't reverse. I'm seeing that in some of our older members of our church. They have gotten to a point and they've really seen a decline in their health. What, what would be the response of someone who's depending upon themselves as opposed to someone who's depending upon God? Two more examples. A cold marriage that I can't unthaw. What would it look like for someone who's self-dependent? What would it look like with someone who's trusting God? And the last one is my own heart. I can't change my own heart. And so I'm wanting that kind of conversation to take place. What is happening is he says false religion. That's the title. But the issue that's, that's fundamental to, to false religion is self-reliance. And, and self-reliance keeps us from turning to God. And, re, and self-reliance causes us to reject God. Which religion do you approach with life? False religion or dependence upon God? The second point is a misplaced trust, and that's verses 9 through 10. And uh, as, as we read this passage, these two verses, I want the group to listen for the consequences of Israel's sin. Israel, you have sinned since the days of Gibeah, they have taken their stand there. Will not war against the unjust overtake them in Gibeah? I will discipline them at my discretion. Nations will be gathered against them to put them in bondage for their double iniquity. So I'm wanting the class to tell me, well, what are the consequences? And, and I might ask, what did your commentary, your personal study guide, tell you about Gibeah? And they can find that on page 85 and 86 in their personal study guide. It's, it's another opportunity to, to reinforce the idea of studying the lesson uh, before they come. And uh, then you can talk about Gibeon. What, what he's doing is he's saying there was an event that happened in the past that revealed Israel's rejection of God. And that past event is still being projected today in God's people. He, he talks about the fact that uh, um, I will discipline them at my discretion. That is to tell us that judgment is, uh, is something that God appoints. And, and uh, he determines how it's going to happen. In the story of Gibeah, it was the other Israelite tribes that uh, brought judgment on the tribe of Benjamin. But what's going to happen here is he's going to bring other nations that will bring judgment against them. This idea of double iniquity has about as many interpretations as there are people in your class. It could mean uh, then as it is now. It could mean uh, just a double emphasis uh, upon evil. It could be, as your leader's guide says, uh, a reference to their foolish apostasy and their smug trust in their military establishment instead of their trust in God. But the point of it is, is they are resistant and rejecting of God. Now, I want to leave, uh, uh, I, I want to look at that list that we've made of the consequences. And it will be a ugly list. It, it will be a frightening list. Um, and this gives us an opportunity to interact with the text. Misplaced trust means your trust is directed toward the wrong thing or the wrong person. Israel faced judgment because of misplaced trust in false gods and in their military. So what was Israel's view of God? Because they had a misunderstanding of God. 
Uh, how did they understand God from the things that we've been reading and studying in Hosea? And um, more than likely, they saw him as a pagan God, which was a God that you bargained with and you manipulated to get what you wanted. And so they had placed their trust in a false kind of God. So what you see here is uh, this was their view of God. Now that's not uncommon in our day. And what I want to do with the class, I want to talk about the different ways people view God today. Because many people, in a, according to surveys, believe in God. But when you dig down deeper into the meaning of that, it's certainly not the God of the Bible. So for example, let's take uh, people in the church. There's some people who've placed their trust in baptism. And the truth of the matter is they've only gone through a ceremony and gotten wet. They really haven't placed their trust in God. Others, maybe it's church attendance. That's what they're placing their trust in to be acceptable for God. What would the class suggest would be some other things? And my point is, is even in the church, there are people who have misplaced their trust. It's not in the real God of the Bible. It is in some image or belief that they have formed elsewhere. Now, when it comes to the American people, think of some of the ways that they believe about God. You might ask the class, what are some of the ways that the American people think about God? Now, for example, you'll hear someone say, well, I don't believe God would ever send anybody to hell. Well, the God that they believe in is absolutely true. That God would not send somebody to hell. But the God of the Bible is a God of judgment and a God of holiness and a God of justice, and He certainly will send people to hell who reject Him. There are people who believe in a Santa Claus God. He's there to give them gifts. There are people who believe in a judge God. That is, He's always there looking to catch them to do something wrong. There are people who believe in a grandpa God. He just winks at our sins and our little inconsistencies and he just overlooks those kinds of things. Friend, that is misplaced trust. And what this lesson is saying is God's judgment will be experienced by those who reject him, and they're rejecting the true God. The third point of the lesson is what could have been, verses 11 through 12. And he starts off by describing what could have been had they stayed true to God. Look at verse 11. Ephraim is a well-trained calf that loves to thresh, but I will place a yoke on her neck. I will harness Ephraim, Judah will plow, Jacob will do the final plowing. Now again, this is an opportunity to ask them, how did the personal study guide explain that? And it gives you an opportunity to reinforce that as well as deal with the text. Now the picture is a well-trained calf that loves to thresh. The calf, uh, the cow would be used to crush the grain and it wasn't muzzled and it could, it could uh, eat as it worked at that time. The work was not a heavy work, a difficult work. Whereas when, it, when the cow plowed, there was no eating until the end of the day of work and the work was more difficult and harder and more uncomfortable with that yoke on its neck. So he's saying, I will harness Ephraim and Judah will plow. And imagine how difficult it must be to break up new ground. And then this idea, the final plowing, some translations use the word harrowing. And, and my understanding is that's breaking up the clods. And so it's very hard work. If you've ever done any kind of agricultural work, you know that it's very difficult work. So here's a picture. This is what they could have had. But instead, because of their rejection of God, this is what they will have. So what would it have looked like had Israel been a people who repented and sought God as opposed to a people who rejected God? What could the nation have possibly looked like? And basically what you're going to do is you're going to see a description of any nation that seeks after the living God. This could be a description of our nation 
if we would seek after God. But rejecting God brings hardship, difficulties into the life. Now notice in verse 12, he uses vivid pictures to instruct us on how to respond rightly. And I want to go through each of these pictures with the class and seek their explanation of what's happening. So in one sense, what we're going to do is a group uh, meditation. And that's just a good way to teach your class how to do Bible study. For example, sow righteousness for yourselves and reap faithful love. What, what does it mean to sow righteousness? Uh, it's a picture of a farmer scattering his seed. And the word righteousness is talking about being in a right relationship with God and then continuing to do right in a way that pleases Him. And notice that he says, for those who live this way, who sow righteousness, notice what the outcome is. They reap something. They reap faithful love. That word is the Hebrew word hesed, which has no uh, English equivalent. And so the English translators use all kinds of words to try to get at the meaning of this word in its context. Here it's faithful love. In other places it'll be called steadfast love. The King James Version just made up a word and called it loving kindness. And the word has about it a combination of the word love and generosity and commitment. It, is, uh, it describes a deep personal care with a loyalty that will not fade. And the scripture says that this is the way our God is because this is the character of our God and this is the way His people are to be because this is the character of His people. So how do you become a person of faithful love, a person of generosity, love and commitment, a person of loyalty that will not fade? So righteousness. Now, what do you suppose he's getting at when he says, break up your unplowed ground? And that phrase, break up, is a command. What is he talking about? It's talking about, of course, the idea of repentance, of, of being open to God's teaching and, and changing our ways. And then he says, it is time to seek the Lord until He comes. And, and the idea there is uh, this is a time... Uh, to repent because it's a passing time. It's written in a way that speaks of urgency. You won't always have this time. When God's Spirit speaks to you about sowing righteousness or breaking up fallow ground, that's the time in which you're to respond until He comes and sends righteousness on you like rain. Here in Oklahoma, we're in a, a drought and just recently we had rain. And it was such a blessing for the state. And that's what it means when it says righteousness on you like rain. It's synonymous with blessing. Can you imagine what it would look like if this nation experienced the blessing of righteousness? If God just poured out righteousness on our nation, so many of our social ills would be dealt with. So. You, you can do that with, uh, in terms of dealing with uh, their responses. Now, now, what I'm wanting to do is uh, I'm wanting to leave those responses on the board from this response. What, what would it look like if they had been obedient to God? And, and, and those things that need to respond that produces that. Because I'm going to compare that to the last point in uh, verses 13 through 15, sowing unrighteousness. But Israel trusted their false religion and military. They wouldn't trust God. They rejected Him. And it produced injustice in the land. And now they're going to face judgment. So as I read through this, look at the contrast uh, that verse 13 through 15 is in contrast to verse 11 and 12. And you'll read through that and you can just list the things out to the side that's going to happen uh, to the nation because they continue to reject God. Now, where, after we've done that, I want to come back to this idea of accountability. Where do we see accountability practiced today? Well, one is in sports. If a coach doesn't win, 
he's held accountable for that regardless of the quality of his athletes. If an athlete doesn't perform as he is expected, then he'll be put on the bench and somebody else will take his place. So we see accountability practiced in sports. How about in politics? We're in the political season right now and some politicians will be replaced by other people. They've been held accountable by the voters. How about report cards? Our children bring home accountability cards, uh, how they've performed in their educational processes. Deadlines, I have a deadline come Sunday when it comes to preaching and the church will hold me accountable for how I've used my time this week. What about customer satisfaction? Uh, business will either thrive or fail depending on how accountable they are in performing their services. And, and uh, I'm just simply giving some examples, hoping that they'll give me s several examples. I might just start off with the sports one because it's the easiest and then just see where we go from there. So the point is, sowing unrighteousness is going to result in accountability. God's judgment will be experienced by those who reject Him. In the Go Explore the Bible, uh, there is a story about an Amtrak train in Southern California in which the track is on unstable ground. Uh, I even found a, about a two, three minute news uh, article that I might use in my class on Sunday to help the class understand about this issue. And then the article in the Go Explore the Bible gives you some other information that wasn't at least in the news article that I saw. The, the ultimate way to fix it to avoid the erosion that's happening where the track is at is to completely relocate the track and that's going to cost about four billion dollars. Our lesson challenges us to examine where our relationship with God has eroded. Are we, are we involved in something that's like false religion? There's a sense of self-dependence, self-reliance, where there should be dependence upon God. Is it a misplaced trust? We're trusting something else and we should be trusting the living God. Are we sowing unrighteousness? And how do we respond according to the scripture, scripture about sowing righteousness and receiving faithful love? God's judgment will be experienced by those who reject Him a good word, a sobering word for our day. Thank you and God bless you for, for your teaching of Sunday School.